All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Today is uh, Saturday, January 30th. We're already through the month of January. So for the next couple minutes, uh, we'll be letting people in. Our guest today is Jim Hoobler with the Nashville City Cemetery Association. Jim, how are you doing this morning? Doing well. How are you? Doing? I'm fine. Thanks for being our guest. It's a, um, it's a gloomy Saturday. It's, um, you know, I think it was gloomy most of the week. I remember it snowing at one point for about five minutes. And we had a blizzard downtown. It was great. Then it stopped and then the sun came. <laughs> I was like, what happened? <clears throat> but uh, anyway, uh, we're welcoming people in. Let me ask you, uh, you have some interesting things behind you in your bookshelf. Anything interesting that we need to know about? It looks like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. It looks like you have a lot of uh, very interesting pieces back there. There are some interesting pieces. There's some Egyptian shabtis, the, the little tomb figures that were supposed to help you in the next life. Mm -hmm. There's a little uh, uh, Greek uh, bronze. There's a Roman oil lamp, uh, some Chinese ceramics. Lot, lots of esoterica. <laughs> so while Strange we're, uh, things. While we're waiting for uh, most, we'll, most we'll of the books are art. Oh. Are art books? Go ahead. Um, so did you? Um, yeah, art like, and architecture. Like, like writers of the lost art, did you go out and uh, accumulate these pieces and you know rob them from ancient vaults and you know have that kind of life, or did you just get them in other ways? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> the uh, the Roman piece and the, the Greek piece, I was in a bazaar in Albania where they don't have any restrictions on export and just bought them in a shop. How interesting. <clears throat> All right. Um, well, um, and uh, for those of you just joining, we're having a little bit of feedback problem, but we'll get through it. Um, let's go ahead and start. Uh, so our guest today is Jim Hubler, who is the chairman of the Nashville City Cemetery Association. And um, his official title uh, when he was with the state was that he was the senior curator of art and architecture to the state museum. So uh, Jim, welcome. Um, a couple of things we usually start out with. I think council member John Rutherford is on the call. Uh, welcome council member. Uh, we have um, the reports today. Our numbers uh, with uh, uh, COVID seem to be going you know, down somewhat. 364 new cases since yesterday, three additional deaths. Um, I know there's lots of discussion going on, particularly with the schools. And uh, I know the mayor decided to let the, the downtown folks open a little longer. Um, that's a good sign. I know there's a lot of work going on with uh, vaccinations, um, both um, obviously nationally at the state level and at the city level. Um, I can tell you that, um, I know it's still difficult outside. Uh, be careful, wear your mask, do everything else that you're supposed to. Um, just really, really be careful. This is where we really have to, again, buckle down. We've got a, we got a ways to go, but um, hopefully more vaccines are coming and we'll get through this. So uh, that's your pep talk for today. All right, so um, Jim, welcome. My first question to you is this. Uh, and Council Member Withers is on, I, I see that. So welcome Council Member Withers. So Jim, uh, tell, me, um, tell me about yourself. How in the world did you become um, our own Indiana Jones? How did, where are you from and how did you end up being so interested in these things? I was born in Toledo, Ohio. And before I even started school, my parents would take me to the and it's it's an encyclopedic collection it goes from antiquities like Egypt and Babylon up to the present it's where the studio glass movement started with Harvey Littleton and Dominic Labine administration there in the early 60s which of course Chihuly and other contemporary artists learned from and I just we went to a church there that was in a unbelievable Victorian neighborhood with these huge mansions with enormous Enormous carriage backyards. So I, I loved art and architecture even even before school. And uh, 
When I was 14, my dad got transferred to Atlanta in 1964, which was an interesting time to be moved to the Deep South. It was the year of the uh, Civil Rights Act, uh, huge demonstrations all over the country. Uh, they still had segregated restrooms and water fountains in Atlanta uh, as a reaction to the state that we're building the world's largest Confederate memorial on Stone Mountain, the place that the Ku Klux Klan was reborn at. Um, and then in 72, I came up here to do graduate school at Vanderbilt and worked at the law library and arts. Uh, got a call from a friend, Dick Wiesner, who said, we want you to come to work and be the director of the Tennessee Historical Society. I said, great. <laughs> so I did that for 10 years and uh, lobbied to have the Vatican restored. It was named by the House and Chair. They created a position of curator of the Capitol, and I was put into that position. And then uh, Lois Riggins Zell, the director of the State Museum, also asked me to be the uh, curator of art for the state. State museums to the title you gave, Art and Architecture. So uh, go back, tell me the name of the place in Toledo that you would go visit. What Was it a museum? The Is that where you would go? Toledo, mm -hmm, the Toledo Museum of Art. Okay. And is it still up there, Jim? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if anybody's doing a major exhibition on it, uh, um, like El Greco, for example, when the National Gallery and the Prado put it together, they borrowed Toledo's piece. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to write it down as a place that I need to go visit. I don't think I've ever been to Toledo. Um, anyway, okay, I'll mark it down. Okay, so before we get into um, the city cemetery stuff, tell me, um, as being kind of the curator of arts and architecture around the capital, Tell me something interesting that maybe we all don't know. I know that we know that Strickland was is buried in the side. Anything interesting that most people wouldn't know about about the Capitol that that you would know about because of your position? Well, it's a national landmark, and I think it it's that not only for its architecture but its history. It's one of the few pre-Civil War capitals. It still functions in there, the governor, comptroller, treasurer, secretary of state. Uh, it's where Tennessee left the United States when it seceded from the Union. It was the first Southern capital to be conquered by the U.S. Army and control. It's where African Americans were given citizenship and, and the right to vote. It's where women were given the right to vote. So I think of it as, as a place that expands voting rights and a monument to democracy. Interesting. Tell me, because um, I've never known the true story of um, um, the, the walkway up to the second floor from the first floor, the story about uh, gunshots and, and bullet holes and things like that. Is that all true? I, I don't believe it is. If you, what, the judge who ordered a posse to go up to the cap legislators that the governor had unilaterally arrested and imprisoned without trial in the Capitol, uh, clearly unconstitutional and beyond his authority. Uh, when they got up there, according to the trial of the judge, the governor was very angry with the judge. Um, he was impeached, but in the testimony, it states that the men came to the Capitol and they talked their way in and they walked out with one of the legislature. And later that night, they smashed a window in the Supreme Court room and snuck out with another one. The governor, though, got the sergeant at arms to scour the terrain and they found them. They brought them back in, locked them up again. And that's the amendment that gave citizenship to African Americans. Bad process, good outcome. I got it. But no um, gunfight. Uh, no gunfight. So, so when I walk up and um, there's, there's gaps in the, uh, in the, marbles, um, you know, stairwell, uh, stair, uh, the rail, the stair rail, um, handrail. Yeah, the handrail. So that's not where people shot. <laughs> I always thought it was made the story better anyway. You know, guides for years told that story. I, I don't, given the court testimony, I don't believe it. 
Okay. All right. Wait, you just ruined, you just ruined part of my story. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so now switch over before we go to the city cemetery, switch over to the museum. Anything interesting? I, you know, I, obviously we can go down there, a brand new facility, great, great facility. And we, uh, and we'll talk about the library and archives building in just a minute. But anything interesting that, that you know that people would find really interesting that's down there, or maybe that's not even out that we've got access to that uh, people would find interesting. One of the things that I love was the old Bellmead Theater. And when Kermit Stengel was getting ready to develop it as a bookstore, he called me and said, Jim, do you want the wall of thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and every time there was a uh, movie premiere in Nashville and they'd try to get one of the stars or producer down, they'd take a picture of them, put it up there. But my favorite piece of that was they had two Marvel panels for the actors and, and producers to autograph. One of the very first ones was Walt Disney who autographed it and he himself drew Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck on it. We have that at the museum. Very cool. Is it out or is it just not out at this point? It's just yeah. it's tucked away. It isn't out right now. There, there's a, a probably only 2% of the collection is out. 98% of it's still in the Polk building. That's so interesting. Very cool. Okay, so somebody had asked a question over uh, the week about the new library and archives building, when it's going to be open. Do you have any idea? Mm -hmm. Do you know when it's supposed to be have its grand opening? They don't have an official date, but it, it's scheduled to open and it is on scheduled to open in April. And they're beginning the process shortly of starting to move everything out of the present building into that building. Okay, all right. And I don't even know, are they gonna have, um, I know it's full of information, but are they gonna, do they set up the new building so people can have a better place to access the information and, um, you know, have a place to sit down and study and things like that. Looks like they've got extra space. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. They um, have photographs of them installing the, uh, the research tables and desks in there. And they've got a very robust website where you can go online and do research as well. All right. So Kim Hinton, who's the, uh, an architect, uh, mm -hmm. is um, saying that mid-April is when they're going to open up and that they are going to have plenty of rooms up on the second floor for people. Yeah. So um, thanks, Kim. That's and good. parking. And parking. That's even better. All right. Well, I think everybody's going to be looking forward to that. So you have the museum down there and uh, library and archives. It should be really, really a, a great place to go. Um, okay. Take us to the Nashville City Cemetery. How, how, from what you understand, how did it get started? And um, how many people are in there? And who is in there? Who is in that city cemetery? And, and, and maybe first well, ex explain where it is so that if people have no idea, most people, a lot of people never knew it was sitting there, but uh, tell us a little bit about the cemetery. Okay, and, and I'm glad to see Carol Busey, our county historian is here and she and Carol Kaplan wrote through the cemetery. So we've definitely got a major expert here on it. It, it opened in 1822 as the first public cemetery in Nashville. Uh, there had been a burial ground, we believe over the street that they moved burials from. Um, there are approximately 22,000 burials in it. And of that, about 6,000 are African American burials. And interestingly, before our state constitution was changed in 1834 and started really ratcheting up segregation in the state, um, anybody could buy a lot anywhere. So African Americans were, were people in the cemetery. Um, I think one of the most interesting graves out there is Sally Thomas. She was a slave from Virginia whose owner's brother, went, so the owner sent her to Nashville and she started a laundry here and uh, was saving money from that to uh, buy her children's freedom and succeeded in um, the freedom of one of them 
Another one was freed by the, uh, the riverboat captain who he worked with. And the third one, when her owner, their owner died, um, told her to run for your freedom. And he, he ultimately did get away. But uh, Fletch Coke is a great researcher and she found where the grave was. And the city cemetery uh, paid for a new tombstone for Sally Thomas. And Franklin, the great uh, historian, wrote a book called In Search of the Promise. Read, it's Sally's story. Sadly, the, the first Chief Justice of the Tennessee Supreme Court, Catron, also got her pregnant. And interestingly, in the uh, Dred Scott decision, where he found that African Americans are simply property, he in effect ruled that his own child human, he was just property. So we didn't hear some of that. So tell me again. Uh, um, all right. So Sally Thomas buried there. Got that. Um, the city cemetery got her a new headstone. Um, but um, there's a book you were you gave me the title of the book and I didn't get all that completely. What's the name of the book? In, in Search of the Promised Land. In Search of the Promised Land. Okay. And then the judge that got that impregnated her was a was a judge with uh, Tennessee Supreme Court. He was the first Chief Justice, John C. Catron, and okay. Jackson appointed him to the U U.S. Supreme Court. And up there in the Dred Scott decision, he found that his own child was simply property, not human. Okay, very interesting. Okay, <clears throat> so um, a lot of people know that the, the city cemetery, which um, the easiest way to get to it is off the interstate and take 2nd or 4th Avenue and head um, south. Uh, and it will be, um, it's just right there. You can see the, the main entrance is right, kind of right on 4th, correct? Right, at 4th and Oak Street, it's on the right as you're going south before the railroad tracks. Yeah. And uh, that's interesting before, when the railroad was run through there, uh, right before the Civil War, uh, um, became an occupied city and they built Fort Nagley on top of the hill right next to the cemetery. The federal government used that land across from the railroad tracks as burial ground for thousands of federal troops. And, and following the Civil War, uh, they exhumed them and started the National Cemetery here out in Madison. Interesting. Okay. Didn't know that. So uh, Carol Busey, I know is on the line. She said that there were no hidden tunnels under there. That where people would escape. No, Nashville's solid bedrock. We'd, we'd have to have some pretty enterprising gophers to make tunnels all through that rock. All right, that's what she said. So I was just making sure that um, that everybody's on the same page. Tell me, uh, our founding fathers for Nashville, are they in that city cemetery? And who are they? Who's in there? James and Charlotte Robertson are there. They were relocated there about 100 years ago. Uh, but he is, of course, one of the founders founders of Nashville. There are a number of other pioneers there. Um, there are soldiers from the Revolution, the War of 1812, the Seminole War, the Mexican War, the Civil War, uh, right up into century wars. Uh, so it, it's like a living history museum of our history here in Nashville. It's an open air museum and there are interpretive panels out there and you can read the history so the people are interred there. Okay, so if, if somebody really wanted to, um, to, go, to go explore, to go, to, to go see this open air history museum, what's the best way to do it? I know, uh, and you can talk about some of the stuff the city cemetery does, but if you wanted to go just go tour, you're, you're allowed to go in. You don't have to have a special ticket or anything. The, the, the right. gates are open, correct? Correct. They're open from about dawn till dusk. And there you can either just walk through the cemetery and read the interpretive panels, or there's an app you can download on your, your phone and get a guided tour of there. And of course, in the fall, we hope with, that COVID will be gone and we can do the Living History Tour again in October. Okay, so tell folks about the Living History Tour. How does that work? There are 
uh, individuals who portray the people that are buried in the cemetery. And it, it's sort of a first person narrative. So for example, I was uh, William Carroll at one point. So as William Carroll, I was telling Murray. And I had the biggest monument in the cemetery in the state of Tennessee put it here. I fought alongside General Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans and I commanded the Tennessee troops there. I brought the first steamboat to Nashville and I named it for my friend Jackson. I beat Opryland to the punch with that one, but it was the very first steamboat on the Cumberland River. <laughs> All right, so people can just walk, can, can go into the city cemetery and they can walk around and there, there will be markers and, and things. I know there's also the little, um, uh, it's like a little maintenance building in the middle. Is there anything on there that's helpful in terms of kind of understanding what's around? There is a uh, computer there, but Wi-Fi is sort of spotty. So I, I would recommend using your own cell phone and uh, the app that you can download to get a, a personal tour of the cemetery with, with people reading stories about that are there in the cemetery. Okay, so people can go on their own or they can do the, the living history tour. Um, all right, tell me, um, give me, an, uh, well, you can tell me what your favorite um, either monument or grave marker or whatever. What's a really, uh, give me one or two that are just really, really interesting. I've been in there. There's some pretty unique things that are in that facility, in the cemetery. Yeah, yeah. As, as you're going in the cemetery to the left are two monuments that were designed by the great architect, William Strickland. My mm -hmm. favorite one of the two is, is the John King monument. He was a stone cutter who became ill and died working on the Capitol. And the other stone cutters took up a collection and got Strickland to build his or design his monument. On the top of it, there stone cutters work shelf with all of his tools laid down symbolically for the last time. So that that's an interesting monument. But going back to the the maintenance building you were talking about, as you go through the breeze way there ahead, you'll see a monument with an urn on top and a butterfly carved on it which is sort of a symbol of rebirth, of course. And signed on it is the name A. Hyman, Adolphus Hyman, the architect of the asylum Belmont, lots of other buildings around here, designed that tombstone. And, and who's, is there somebody in that tombstone? Is that him? No, it was a, a family that hired, but, but uh, to me, he's more important than the people that are there. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, the um, so the only people that are um, you said that there are twenty two thousand uh, burials there. Not everyone is marked. Mm -hmm. So um, I know there's a lot mm -hmm. of, particularly in the front, there are lots of markers. But um, the land goes further, and there's no markers out there. So who's buried out there? Mm -hmm. The inventory that we have of who is buried there, the interment records indicate the, the 22,000. That area is in its area uh, topographically, so it, it probably periodically was, was flooding. Mm -hmm. So we presume that's sort of like the uh, less desirable part of the cemetery and people of lesser means would be buried there. When Mayor Purcell got the, the council to appropriate funding for the restoration of the cemetery, they did some probing out there and found some tombs that had collapsed and been buried. Uh, we found Thomas was out there, a number of other enslaved people were out there. Um, but a lot of those people couldn't afford tombstones. So if they were doing their best, they might have only had a wooden one, which would have rotted away. Okay. So uh, the Cemetery Association paid for wooden markers for convicts at the state penitentiary who died in a cholera epidemic. And those are lined up in that area out there. Okay, and so people can go walk out there and see kind of what's wooden. going on. There. Um, what, about, um, what about the stories when all this stuff was going on with Fort Negley? 
we knew that there were people, or at least the stories were that there were people that were buried on the, on the, the sides of Fort Negley. Um, were there other people that were buried in the city cemetery that were also involved in the construction of the fort? We don't believe so. It was a, a public cemetery um, and they were selling plots. We don't think they were burying the enslaved people that, that died working on building the fortifications in Nashville. The probability is they're buried on the slopes up there. And the Historical Commission is, is seeking additional funding to do some archaeological studies up there. Um, Zeta Law is a friend of mine and she's she's been doing some uh, research up there. They're trying to, to, if there are burials and if so, where they are up there to, to honor the dead that, that are probably on the site. All right. So the, and the only, the people, the only people who, who are allowed to be buried now in uh, this city cemetery are people who have, have family plots or are descendants of the people in the facility or in the cemetery. Um, and then the mayors, mayors can be buried in the cemetery, right? Okay. Um, and um, right. is there a, a, a is there a, I know Mayor Fulton is buried in the city cemetery. Are there special plots for the mayors and are they, is that kind of, because I haven't been in, I don't think I know where Mayor Fulton is buried, uh, but is there a special area for, for, for former mayors? Is that how it works? It, in the 19th century, they, they just had plots as they purchased them, with, so they're pretty scattered around in that period. More recently, since Mayor West had it restored in the 1950s, he and uh, one of his sons are now buried there to, to the right as you're looking at the, the Keeble building there in the Missbury. And more recently, Mayor West is buried, or Mayor Fulton is buried to the left. Mayor Barry's son is buried also to the right up on the next street over to the facing the cemetery. There's there's a bench up there for her uh, her son. Okay. Um, okay, so let me and ask you this. Bill Purcell when he was say, say it again about Mayor Purcell. Bill Purcell restoring the cemetery said Yeah, he said, you know, maybe someday I should be here. <laughs> I'll ask the mayor next time I talk to him about what that. <clears throat> All right, so um, if somebody, and I know Zeta, I know there's a lot of information out there. I know that people can go into the city cemetery and walk around and go to the living history tour. But if somebody really wanted to get a better understanding of the city cemetery, should they go to the website? Is there a book out? Should they go to the library? If they're really interested, because to many people, this should be really fascinating. It's I always, when I first got involved with this, it was like, this is a hidden history jewel that most people didn't even know was here. How do they find out more about who's in there and about the history of this thing? Well, Fletch Koch has been leading the drive to really have a robust uh, uh, presence on, on, on the internet. So on the website, they'll find a lot of information. Also, there's this book that Carol Busey and Carol Kaplan did that's a history of the cemetery, and they can down that website also uh, and get lots of interesting stories about the history of the cemetery and the life histories of the people that are buried there. Okay. I remember if you want to volunteer, I went out there one, one year and I think was helping to clean off the tombstones. Um, do they still do that? Um, I know that um, there's a lot, and a lot of that stuff is, I mean, you're you're touching history, so you want to be obviously very careful. But are there, uh, there are there volunteer opportunities to go out there and help and kind of help clean up some of the stuff that, you know, just clean up some of the tombstones to just make the place look better? The tombstones, a lot of them are from local limestone, so they're very fragile, so we don't any longer advocate people out there scrubbing tombstones. We have hired uh, professionals to clean, and they're incrementally, as the cemetery association can raise the money, uh, they're incrementally cleaning off portions of the. So one thing that the public can do to volunteer is hands-on Nashville 
does a number of things through the through the months. Once a month, they go out there and pick up uh, debris. They pick up uh, magnolia leaves or magnolia seed pods. Um, there's also something called the weed, where the vol the uh, uh, gardeners um, go out there and try and cut the uh, the invasive plants that that crop up out there and uh, maintain the the cemetery. Also, the managers uh, work out there and maintain some of the plots. A number of the, the plots were actually laid out as small gardens. Um, so the, the volunteer gardeners maintain some of those as well as around the Keeble building. There are a number of opportunities to do that. One other thing that we do is uh, as the weather improves, we're hoping to do a once a month uh, program out there where somebody leads a guided tour through portions of the cemetery with a with the theme for everyone. Okay, uh, so we've had a request uh, for two stories. Uh, one is um, Captain William Driver and his tombstone. And the other one is for the story of the girl who jumped into the Cumberland. So uh, can you do both of those? Yeah, we can start with the girl that jumped in the Cumberland. She didn't do it. <laughs> that. That's a good story. Level the, the gunfight in the Capitol, it, it just isn't true. Somebody made that <laughs> that whopper up a number of years ago, and it, it continues to live on. But uh, Carol Kaplan actually looked into that, and the lady was did not kill herself. Um, and the story about being afraid of the dark and hanging the lamp over her, that, that's just another good story. Captain Driver, though, is is a real person and, and a real story. He uh, was from in, uh, Salem, Massachusetts. And when he got his first commission on a whaling ship as a captain, the ladies up there made a flag for him. And he sailed around the world with it twice. He found the bounty mutineers and took them back to Pitcairn. And uh, he, was, he was very fond of St. Patrick's Day. So he lived in South Nashville down on Fifth Avenue kind of in that redevelopment area today. On the way to the track, and he would string a line across Fifth Avenue and hang that flag over it. His name for that flag was Old Glory. And he was a unionist, so having grown up in New England. So when the war came along, his boys having grown up here, they ran off with their buddies and enlisted as Confederate infantry. Dad no longer trusted his own and so he asked a neighbor to hide old glory in a quilt for him when Nashville was Confederate for nine months. Some of the, the local people would come banging on the door and want to get old glory and destroy it. And uh, he didn't have it. It was hidden. But when Nashville became the first Confederate state capital to fall to the U.S. military, he rushed down to the Capitol and old glory was a huge flag that flew over the first conquered cabin. So you can bet the northern newspapers picked up on that. And that's when America learned the story, the title of that new uh, banner, Old Glory. And when he died, he had a tombstone made that's, that's like a tr tree trunk limbs, which signifies a life cut short, although he wasn't that young. Yeah. But it had a ship's anchor on it and other, <clears throat> other symbols of his, his uh, sailing life. And that flag is now in the Smithsonian has been, and twice the Tennessee State Museum paid to have it conserved and brought to Nashville briefly for exhibition. But it's so fragile, it's usually kept in dark storage at the Smithsonian. Okay. All right, so go back to the girl who jumped in the Cumberland, even though I've heard that story. Um, just pretend, <laughs> just pretend that it's actually was true. So uh, tell people that story. What uh -huh. I, I've heard it. Uh, just um, just go ahead and tell us uh, as if it was a good story. Well, it is a good story. It, it just isn't true. Uh, supposedly her her beau married somebody else and she was grief stricken over that and threw herself off a rock into the Cumberland. And supposedly that rock with the light on it is the rock she jumped from. And he was sorry about it, so he knew that she was afraid of a lantern hung over it at night. It, it, it's a good story, but it isn't true. 
There's one that is true that's the other Strickland tombstone, though, as you're going down that drive again, coming into the cemetery on the left, the, there is a marker that has a, an, an opening in it, and then there is a stone burning torch at the top, and that's, that's the, the Walker Monument, and she was a beautiful young lady who, um, her husband grief-stricken, hired the best architect in the city to do this monument. Her name is there, and then there's a blank spot for him, he loved her forever, and was going to be buried with her. Not so. He, he did live long enough to find another beautiful young lady, and he married her, so he's not with the first wife. Okay. Uh, Where in is... that opening is a lacrimal urn. <clears throat> Is a what? What's in the yeah. opening? A, a urn for the collection of the mourner's teardrops, a lacrimal urn, you know, your lacrimal ducts, eternal flame at the top because he was going to mourn her forever. <laughs> okay, so I love that story. If somebody were looking for the, the, the girl who jumped into the river, there's an actual, is there a rock with a lantern on it? Where is that? Yes. As you're facing the Keeble building, that, that building in the middle of the cemetery, look to your immediate right and you'll sit with the lantern hanging from the top of it. Okay. It's the Sanders Monument. Okay. All right. All right. So bef if, before we leave the city cemetery, I'm going to ask a few questions that people ask about over the week. Anything else, anything else interesting that people, if they're walking around, because if you go in, and I would recommend that you go, uh, and you can walk around, you know, I, I love the story um, about the, the lady who jumped into the Cumberland with the, the lantern. Um, I didn't know about the, the, um, the other stone uh, for the lady whose husband, you know, um, built the stone and then left it open and, the, and you've got this place for tears. Um, anything else that just people would go, you know what, I, I got to go see, I got to go see this particular stone. One bad ones is again, as you're coming in the main drive and you look off to the right, you'll see some big magnolia trees. Under one of those is a little tombstone for a, a child who died, a very young child, probably an infant. And symbolic over it is the blanket for the night so the child could sleep warmly through the evening. Uh, one of the more interesting ones, we think of Victorians as being so prudish, is you go up to the right uh, and up towards the top of the hill, there is a marker with a couple spooning in bed for eternity. And you don't think of something from the 80s or 50s being that, uh, depicting that graphically. <laughs> the Victorians were a little bit prudish about things. And uh, actually a couple spooning for eternity is something you, you're surprised to see in a cemetery. And, and where exactly is that one? Where is that one? I don't think I've ever seen that one. I'll, I'll show you someday. It, as you go in the main drive, it, it's up the hill to eat. <laughs> and it, it's sort of smallish. Uh, again, because it's limestone, it's eroded pretty badly. But if, if you look at it, you can figure out it's a husband and wife together. <laughs> All right. The next time I go in there, I'm going to go try to find it. All right. All right. Let me ask you a couple of the questions that came in over um, uh, the week. Your favorite book about Nashville? You obviously showed us the book about the City Cemetery Association. Somebody asked, what, what's your favorite book? If you want to study the history of Nashville, what would you advise them to do? A, a good introduction would be the book John Edgerton wrote in 1979 for the Bicentennial of Nashville. And uh, John asked me if I'd work on the book with him and he wanted to do five 40-year increments and wanted me to work on one of those. And I told him, John, I'm interested in the whole history. How about if I pull together all of the illustrations for the 200th anniversary? And he agreed. So every, every week we would meet and he would tell me what he was writing about. And then I would tell him about 
things in private hands or public collections that would make great illustrated books. So that was a lot of fun. And it, it's a great read and is a, a quick read on 200 years of Nashville history. Okay. It's called Nashville, the Faces of Two Centuries. The Faces of Two Centuries. Okay. All right. Uh, somebody wanted to know what your favorite piece of artwork was. Maybe they know something that I don't, hmm. but they they wanted to know if you had a, a favorite piece of artwork about, I assume, about Nashville. I, well, I do. It's one of the pieces that I acquired from a good friend, uh, Ridley Wills. It's mm -hmm. called Toqua, which was a Cherokee Indian town, the, the 18th century over in East Tennessee. And the, the Duke de Orleans and the Duke de Montpensier, his brother, came uh, fleeing the reign of terror in, in France, where their father had been guillotined after the revolution, which was ironic because he'd supported the revolution. Um, but they fled to America. They met with President Washington up in uh, Philadelphia, and he gave them some tra travel tips to Americans. So they came to see the Cherokee in East Tennessee. And the Duke de Montpensier sat on a, a, the top of an ancient ceremonial mound and did sketches of the Cherokee town. Uh, when they turned Europe, they were living in Britain at that point because Napoleon was in power now. And uh, the Duke de Montpensier did an oil painting depicting his sketches of, of an 18th century Cherokee town. And that disappeared for well over a hundred years. And it turned up in Australia of all places where a collector had been told it was a Polynesian scene, even though there's not a palm tree in it. Uh, and the, the dugouts were not Polynesian canoes, but Cherokee canoes. And uh, that one has turned up, but, but Ridley's painting was a copy that an Italian had done. And it was the only known option that was done from the original that existed. And uh, Ridley purchased that at auction. And uh, when I saw him in church, I told him, you know, that really needs to be in a public collection someday. It, it's a very significant historic piece. And he agreed. So when the museum opened, he donated it. And it was, it's hanging there. It's one of the first things we put up. But interestingly, it, it also depicts a dugout canoe, mm -hmm. like the one the museum has in its collection, which you can see very close to it there, and documents Cherokee architecture. You can see a summer lodge, which looks like a hayrick, and there are very few images of those. It's a handful, and this is the one that was actually done by someone who saw one. So that's important. And the Cherokee log cabin that's in it differs from European construction. They drove vertical posts into the ground and then wove them uh, with, uh, with vines or something together and had a log roof on it. And it depicts that as well. Very historically significant and we're, we're very grateful to the Wills family for donating it to the state collection. What is, um, I'm gonna to switch to something. What's your, um, uh, what's your favorite part about the new museum? What, if, if somebody hadn't been there, what's, you know, besides looking at everything, what's the one thing that they've got to see before they leave? Oh my. <laughs> um, to me, the great thing about it, it's all encompassing. It goes from prehistory to the present. Um, it's beautifully displayed. There are lots of interactives in there for uh, people to enjoy learning about our, our history. Uh, there's free parking, uh, but the collection is, I think, one of the best in America. Uh, years ago, when Roger Kennedy was the director of the Smithsonian American History Museum, I'd, I'd helped him with on architecture. And he was down visiting and I took him through the museum in the Polk building. And he said, Jim, you know, you guys are doing this better than we do at the Smithsonian. So that's, that's high praise. Mm -hmm. But the collection represents how mm -hmm. Tennessee was in American history and uh, everything from women getting the vote to uh, talking about the enslavement of African-Americans to the Trail of Tears and to great celebrations with expanding voting rights and uh, 
uh, institutions of higher learning in the state. It, it's, it's a remarkable place. We have a, a body of work reflecting James Robertson too, who we just talked about. They were collected by the DAR and the DAR donated them to the State Museum. One of the really neat things to me is there are deer hide moccasins with European beads sewn into a Domingo, a Chickasaw, Chickasaw chief gave to James Robertson and those are in the collection. Very cool. All right, go back. You were talking about um, George Washington. Uh, someone asked a question about Josiah Nickel. Josiah Nickel. Mm -hmm. Tell me who that was and what's the connection with George Washington? He had served under Washington during the, but he was one of the first bankers in Nashville. And uh, he purchased the, the Clay family's home on the, the Lebanon Turnpike, which is called Bel Air. It still stands. Uh, when they built Briley Parkway, they cut a huge trough through the limestone where his family cemetery had been and where his beautiful garden had been. But the house is still there. And if you else, it looks almost line for line like Andrew Jackson's Hermitage before it burned in 1832 with a one story uh, row of columns with a uh, pavilion two stories in the middle and then the two flanking wings. Um, that's a B and B now. You can stay there. Um, but Nickel was one of the wealthiest people in Nashville, and he he greatly expanded that house and the acreage. It got to be almost two at one point. And uh, Dan Pomeroy, who's on here, uh, he and I went up to uh, Paducah, Kentucky, and we got one of the descendants of uh, the Lytles to donate parts of Josiah Nickel his wife, who was a Lytle, Eleonora, and uh, also of Eleonora's parents, um, who was one of the, the founders of Murfreesboro, the Lytles, and uh, they were going to name it for him, but he said, no, you need to name it for my buddy, Hardy Murphy, who fought at the Battle of Kings Mountain and helped us gain our independence. So even though he had given the land for the public square, the public uh, the Presbyterian Church and the land for the cemetery. It's not Lytleville, it's Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro. But all of those portraits are at the museum. So do, his, his wife was one of the founders of the first Presbyterian Church in Nashville also. Okay, so if people were going to look for the house, uh, you take, um, you head out like you're going to the airport, you get on Briley Parkway going north, it's uh, Lebanon Pike exit, is that the exit? Yes, or, or if you just go out Lebanon Pike from downtown, as you cross Briley Parkway, it's immediately to your left, right next to Briley Parkway. All right, so if you were to take the exit off of Briley Parkway on Lebanon Pike, come off the exit, look over to your, I guess, to the north, to your left, and you'll see it. It's sitting there. To All the right. left. All right. An another All right, interesting so story about the Nickel. Sure. Another interesting Nickel family is they owned property downtown and uh, Bradford Nickel was one of their descendants and he, he had uh, become sort of the unofficial historian of Rutledge's Confederate artillery. And Mary Stallman Douglas, Judge Bird Douglas's wife, gave me a, a diary that he had composed during the Civil War where he'd also done a muster roll, which didn't exist anywhere else, of all of the members of Rutledge artillery. Rutledge, of course, had married Middleton. Their parents had both been signers of the Declaration of Independence, and the Rutledges are buried at City Cemetery. And Mr. Nichols survived into old age, but got run over by a streetcar odd way. He was also a member of, of First Presbyterian, where Eleanor had started it. And that property the Nichols owned, when um, Caldwell and company wanted to acquire their property. The, the said they would sell it to them, but only if they put a sign over the door saying that it was the Nickel Building. Well, Rogers Caldwell was was a shrewd old bird, and uh, in a big archway he carved uh, uh, Caldwell right over the entrance, 
and 12 stories up in a tiny little sign that said nickel building. <laughs> Very good. I don't think I knew that story. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, all right, so we have, we have just a few minutes left. There were a couple of questions about Second Avenue. And I know that doesn't have anything to do necessarily with the city cemetery, but tell us, um, tell us what you can about the importance of Second Avenue, the history behind it, and, um, and why it's gonna be so important as we rebuild to try to keep some of that history. Well, if, if, if you've ever read The Grapes of Wrath, there's a great scene where Ma Jode is, they're, they're packing their, their one vehicle and they keep bringing all of these things out and, and uh, she is insisting they go in the car, but there isn't room and they keep throwing them out. And she finally says, how are you, you going to know who you are if you don't remember where you come from? So the importance of connections to the past and, and sharing our history and story are very important. And Second Avenue is the birthplace of Nashville, where Church Street turns at the river, Fort Nashboro was built, and it ran parallel with Church Street, not along the river, but away from the river. And there's a building at Second and Church that... Uh, uh, used as his distribution warehouse. It's still standing. It was a candy factory at one point. And in the basement of that building is the spring that was the water supply for Fort Nashboro. So the city was birthed that land that is now part of the commercial heart or was the commercial heart of the city with all of those warehouses backing up towards the wharf where the river boats would come up. They'd unload their cargo. They'd bring it into the ground floor onto the sales floor and upstairs for storage. So that, that's our commercial heart. That's our commercial history. That's the founding of Nashville uh, right around the corner from there at, uh, I believe it's uh, is where Timothy de Mombrian lived, the first European that lived here. And uh, it, it's just an integral part of our history. And the Metro Historical Commission, the Metro Zoning Commission, Historic Zoning has formed a task force. Cyril Stewart, who is on this call, is the head of that task force. And they hired engineers who found that all of those buildings can be reclaimed, even the one that destroyed. You can put back the facade in place. You don't want to lose the architectural rhythm of that street with, with modern structures. Like in the 1980s, when a developer from Alabama wanted to destroy an entire Bank Street and, and Church Street and First and Second Avenues. Metro told them no. And one night the entire block strangely caught on fire simultaneously and burned to the ground. The fire marshal, the source of the fire was cryptically out of state. <laughs> uh, but that whole block is gone. They wanted to put a 21 story tower there on historic Second Avenue. Historic National Historical Commission fought all of those developers that wanted to level the entire street in the 70s and 80s. They prevailed. Mayor Fulton was a big part of that. At one point, they were talking about tearing down the Ryman Terrace House, tearing down Union Station, tearing down the Hermitage Hotel. And fortunately, we have preservationists in this town who are, are willing to stand up and fight those things. And I think we will, will prevail as an avenue. So there was a question that came in about, um, were there slave trades on Second Avenue back behind the wharf? Is that uh, not a good part of our the, history? The, but the slave market, the market was at uh, the corner where the bus station is now downtown uh, okay. at Third and uh, Charlotte. <clears throat> And in the State Museum collection, there's a slave trader's business on the upper left corner. There's an engraving of them selling or human trafficking there at the corner, selling people. And you can see that shrine of democracy, the capital in the background. Uh, but the slave market was down in there, which is interestingly, the city got away from slavery and morphed into 
some form of, of quasi freedom for African Americans. That became an African American business district. The Duncan Hotel evolved into the segregated IMCA, as they called it. And there were African American businesses along the street there. Um, so it, it, it's a historically African American business district, and the still the one cent savings and loan bank building is still there and, and Metro is looking at trying to repurpose it now as well. So it's That's the right last the, remnant of that African-American business district. Uh, right, that is right on the corner. Of, right on the corner there. That's right. Um, all right. Bird and Charlotte. That's right. Um, well, so I, we are pretty much out of time. I will ask you one more question. Um, this came up with um, I guess when we interviewed Carol Busey, who was on this call, um, but the idea was about a place to a place to put our natural history. A lot of it goes to the State Museum at this point. I know they've got a lot of different things floating around uh, of ours that are there. Uh, we talked to uh, Ken Oliver. They've got some pieces of natural history, but the idea was to have one place where um, there is so much history that Carol talked about, that Ken has, that you talked about today. It'd be nice for visitors that come here, uh, besides going to the hockey talks, and we, we like them, we like them to go to the hockey talks, but um, we see people walking around the Capitol, going to, going to the Bicentennial Mall, a place where you can get history. And so there was discussions after the Carol Busey call to pull in some people to actually start renewing those conversations because I know they've been there in the past and I mentioned it to the mayor. Uh, would you be interested in serving on something like that? Sure, but it's going to be a hard lift because the, um, for in here, John Haywood, who had people go out and do oral interviews of some of the early pioneers, he and Ralph E. W. Earl, the first painter, professional artist, to come here. They did archaeological digs that were destroyed later out where uh, the Bicentennial Mall is now. But they started the first museum this side of the Appalachians down on the public square, Ralph Earl's Museum. That collection evolved through the years the Historical Society, and that is now in trust with the State Museum. That collection was begun almost 200 years ago. So most of the really great early stuff is already in a public collection at the scheme. All right, so um, people are trying to call in, I guess to convince me to tell you to be on this museum, on this group. But, um, I know it may be difficult, but I think, um, I think we'd like to give it a try. So um, I, I may come get you and come and drag you and, and pull, come pulling you to it. But um, I got Carol to agree, and I now just have to get a few more people to the table and see if we can do something. I, I, I'd hate to, I, I, I think it's important enough, Kim Hinton, obviously on this call, um, I think it's important enough to make sure that we protect it and figure out some way to display it. So um, anyway, I'll consider that a yes, okay? I'll just make sure that I, I get you. Okay. All right, <laughs> thank you. All right, Jim, you've been great. Thank you all for being a part of this today. We're off next week. Uh, we'll be back up in two weeks. Um, so uh, you can tune in next week, but nobody will be here. But in two weeks, we'll start back again. Um, Jim, I'll follow up with you on the, um, on the idea of talking about the city's history in one place. Everybody, again, um, have a great weekend. Be safe. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks. All right, thanks, everybody. <laughs>